What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. I am Nicholas. This is Big Dogs Gotta Eat BDGE Fantasy Football. Happy Monday. I hope you're starting your week off with me. I hope your July 4th weekend was a lot of fun. I hope you kept it safe. I hope you didn't drink and bicycle. It's actually becoming a bit of a problem for me, but that's neither here nor here. We're here to talk about the 2019 fantasy football season. Last week, we dove into some mid-round wide receivers. This week, we're going to talk about mid-round running backs. Everyone loves running backs. Every time I put out a running back video, it gets like eight times the amount of views, which is fine by me. In the wide receiver video, we touched on Calvin Ridley, DJ Moore, Mike Williams, what I think about them at their current draft price, what I target them, what I avoid them, what is we doing? We're going to do the same thing with the running backs. This is also the draft guide giveaway video. I did a draft guide giveaway based on, you know, podcast reviews or whatever. So any of you guys that dropped a podcast review, one, thank you for doing so. Two, if you haven't done so already and you enjoy the content, whether it's podcast or YouTube, subscribe to the channel, rating, review, thumbs up, all that nonsense. I will select the draft guide giveaway winners midway through the video. So skip to the timestamp that's down below for where the draft guide winner is to find out if one of them was you. And now we're going to continue on with the video. So Smack that thumbs up, smack that subscribe, tuck your shirts in, stop yelling, let's get it. All right, let's jump into the middle rounds. And this guy is almost not even in the middle rounds anymore. Kenny Drake is the 22nd running back off the board right now per his ADP on FFPC and draft. 44th overall. Literally like a month ago, he was going in the lower 60s. So you were able to get him at the latest, like a late fifth round pick, sixth round pick, even seventh round pick when the summer started. He is now a legitimate fourth round pick in fantasy football leagues. He's one of the more intriguing, I'm not going to say interesting at this price because it's not really that interesting. He's one of the more intriguing running backs, I would say, to discuss for 2019 fantasy football. He somehow finished as like a high-end running back two last year. He was the RB17 in half PPR, but he was also the RB22 in terms of fantasy points per game. So when we look at the end of season stats, like there's more context to put into it. Like RB22 on points per game is not someone that you're like, oh, sick, he was like my RB2 and it did me really well because that wasn't the case for a guy like Drake. He was nearly impossible to put into your lineup for the majority of the season because he'd have two terrible games and then he'd follow it with a 20 point game which you were probably sitting him for then you'd get excited and then he'd have one of those like three point games and then he'd have a 22 point game so that was kind of the the, the season that we had with Kenyon Drake so realistically right he was awful to own but things changed in Miami for the 2019 season he came away from the NFL draft as a winner just the offseason in general Frank Gore is gone, right? He's in Buffalo now, which opens up. I believe it's like 160 carries. Gore was getting double-digit carries every single game pretty much for Miami last year. Drake sits atop the death chart. They have Kalen Balaj, Kenneth Farrow, and they have seventh-round rookie Miles Gaskin. That's basically the only guy they brought in this summer. So at the very worst, Drake is going to be the clear RB1 in Miami with Kalen Balaj probably eating into a little bit of the workload. And last year, you know, splitting time with Frank Gore, he finished as the RB17. So that's pretty good, right? You're looking at that and you're saying he'll probably improve based on the volume. Quietly caught 53 passes in 2018, which goes unnoticed because last year was an absolute explosion in terms of running backs catching passes. That was the 14th highest total at the position. I've mentioned this in many of my running back videos already this summer. Typically, a catch total of 53 passes or 53 receptions would rank you inside like the top five, six, seven at the position on a year-over-year -year basis. Last year was just a crazy, crazy, crazy reception total season for the position, you know, running backs. What else went on in Miami? Much like my concerns for Kenyon Drake going into last year, a lot of them still stand. Is this offense going to be bad? Probably. Is this offensive line going to be bad? Probably. The offensive line graded out 28th last year in run blocking per pro football focus, and they lose Juwan James, arguably their best run blocking lineman to Denver in free agency, sign him to a four-year $51 million contract, probably an overpay on Juwan James, but definitely not good for an offensive line in Miami that didn't have much working for them in the first place. They use a third and sixth round pick on a lineman, but still just the third and a sixth round pick, far from sure things. So again, the offensive line is still very much a concern. Josh Rosen and Ryan Fitzpatrick for the starting quarterback job. I think it's going to end up being a messy situation, much like Fitzpatrick last year in Tampa Bay, right? You have another younger guy who the franchise obviously wants to see what they have before they move on and either draft someone or try to sign someone through free agency. All the reports out of camp are saying that Fitzpatrick is like a whole nother tier above Josh Rosen as it is now. There's going to be a quarterback change at some point during the season and things might 
get messy here. Regardless, it's probably an upgrade either way, but I mean, like, we saw how poorly Rosen played last year when he was constantly under pressure in Arizona. He was one of the worst quarterbacks under pressure, and as we already covered, the Dolphins' offensive line is barely an upgrade. So, like, yes, Fitzpatrick played really well last year for the Buccaneers, but that was just a, a team that was slinging the ball downfield. They had much, much better weapons, arguably a better offensive line, so I'm not expecting these 400-yard passing games from Fitzpatrick. If Rosen's in there, again, it's a very similar situation than he than he had last year in Arizona. So why do we expect him to be a different quarterback? My concern for Kenyon Drake is, is just the overall offense. Like, I don't want to take a fourth round running back, which is where you have to draft Drake now, on an offense that, first of all, I mean, we know he's a starter there, but like how much volume is he really going to get on the ground? I've said this a million times, right? Like we didn't see him carry the ball much in Alaba at Alabama, and I'll go into that in a second. You guys are probably fucking tired of hearing this from me, Kenyon Drake and Josh Jacobs, but the offense is bad. Like you should not be drafting running backs on bad teams in early rounds, right? Or at least not bad teams, but bad offenses that don't project to at least score a decent amount of points per game. They didn't bring anything in on the offensive side of the ball in terms of like weapons, right? They re-signed Devontae Parker. Albert Wilson is coming back and might not even be ready for the season. Kenny Stills, Mike Gusecki. It's hard to imagine them being any better in 2019 than they were in 2018, a year in which they ranked 26th in scoring, less than 20 points per game. So that's not good. The other major change is at head coach and offensive coordinator, right? They bring on the two Pats coaches, Patriots coaches together, who have worked together under Bill Belichick for the last 10 years or so. Uh, Brian Flores will take over as the head coach. He was a defensive coordinator in New England. And then you have Chad O'Shea, the former Pats wide receiver coach. Flores is a defensive specialist, obviously. Uh, Chad O'Shea is going to probably man a lot of the offensive things, but he has literally never called plays in the NFL before. They hired Jim Caldwell. Some of you guys might remember him from the uh, from his Lions days. He is set up to be an offensive assistant, which should help Chad O'Shea, you know, because he's never called plays before. But 2019 overall looks like it might be setting up to be just like an absolute tank job for the Dolphins. And why would you want a running back that's in that situation? Especially outside of full PPR, I have a really hard time. I'm looking at Drake anywhere from, you know, the top five rounds, probably the first six rounds. And lastly, guys, we just don't know what kind of workload Drake is actually going to get. I think we as a fantasy community love Drake as a player. We all are not denying his talent. And we collectively want to see him get a full workload and be the workhorse here in Miami, or at least like a sizable, consistent workload. We had, you know, games last year where he was getting three carries a game, right? He's been in Miami for three years now, and we have seen nothing close to him being the workhorse here. And I know Adam Gase was there, and he's fucking really dumb when it comes to running backs, but he finished the 2017 season on a five-game tear, right? He carried the ball 91 times in that span, and we got all excited, and we're like, yep, 2018 is his year. We started drafting him in this same exact spot, 2017 into 2018. Yeah, he finished the year on a tear. He's going to be the workhorse, whatever. And then he had 91 carries in that five-game span. He had 120 carries altogether in 2018 in 16 games. He saw double-digit carries last year in just five games, while he saw five or fewer carries in 25% of their game. I love the idea of what Drake can be, but to just assume that we're going to see a workhorse roll out of him in 2019, I think is just naive. Going back again to college, he never handled a big workload in college, and he has not yet in the NFL. So it's very possible that we just know who Drake is as a player, and we're not going to see. So he's like an Alvin Kamara, who can be very efficient on touches, can work on all three downs, but he can't hit the ceiling or get anywhere near Alvin Kamara if he's in the Miami offense. Like Alvin Kamara would be nowhere near what he's doing now if he wasn't in the Saints offense. NFL players really just, they, they usually don't change much. We can look at who they are in college. We can look at the rest of the things around them and we can kind of project pretty good into the NFL what they're going to be. On top of that, we already have a three-year sample size of Kenyon Drake in the NFL of who he is. So you can make the excuses that you want to make, but the big facts are there, people. The big facts are there. Drake seems to be a receiving back that has the upside and almost the size of being a workhorse, but the teams just don't want to seem to give him that role. Again, it goes back to Drake is someone that I could see myself targeting in like the sixth or the seventh round, but it's still a bad offense, bad offensive line, unproven coaches, unproven quarterbacks. Don't use a fourth round pick on Kenyon Drake, people, please. One thing you should be using for your 2019 fantasy football season is for the commissioners and for the people that play in season long. It's good for dynasty too. It's good for any league. If you're the commissioner or if you're just a friend of the commissioner, let your commissioner know about this, please. You have to collect money from your friends, from your coworkers, from your colleagues, whatever the case may be, your family. And it's a pain in the ass, right? You get cash from four people, you get a Venmo from someone else, you get PayPal from the other three people. It's a problem. I'm a commissioner of like five leagues. Teamstake.com is a website that you can literally set up your league for free. You don't have to pay for the services. You can enter your league information and all you do is copy a URL, send it out to your friends, whether you're in a group meet, WhatsApp, what text message, group text message, send them the URL, they click on it and they can literally pay the buy-in for your league right there. 
You set the buy-in price. You set the payout prices. You can have it roll over if you want. If it's a dynasty league and you pay 50% up front, there are plenty of options on there to pay and get payouts in which they don't take any money. Again, they don't charge for this service. So if you are the commissioner, literally, this takes out all of the hassle that you've been dealing with. Go set up all your leagues on there. All you got to do is send out links. Here's a URL. How do I buy in? URL, URL, URL. Cop, 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 cop. So teamstake.com sponsoring today's video, but I use them personally. I promise you that. Go check them out. Go sign your league up. Make things very easy for yourself. Let's get into the second running back, Tariq Cohen of the Chicago Bears. He is currently running back 27, 28 off the board in the mid to late 50s. A lot of these like fifth round guys are very similar to Kenyon Drake. Um, they're super intriguing. They're interesting. You feel like they have a lot of upside, but you're not really sure if they're a good season long pick. Everyone likes Tariq Cohen, just like Andy Drake. He's so much fun to watch. He's super explosive. He's like bite size, right? He's a little sample size. And everyone roots for those little guys, right? He had a great 2018 campaign, right? His sophomore season, only his second year. He was 23 years old. Finished as half PPRs, running back 13. Was running back 18 on a points per game basis. So RB 18 on points per game. His stat line last year, 99 rushes. 441 rushing yards, three touchdowns, 89 targets, 71 receptions, 725 receiving yards, and five receiving touchdowns. By all accounts, a great year, over 160 touches, 71 through the air, 1,150 yards from scrimmage, and eight total touchdowns at the age of 23. But as they almost always do for pass catching running backs, those end of season numbers came at the expense of consistency. Cohen had five complete bust games last year, which is most of any running back at where he finished or higher, running back 13 or higher, five busty games, which are from zero to seven half PPR fantasy points. No one was within two games of his busty rate. So 31%, if you look at the overall busty and extra medium, that's up to 12 fantasy points. He scored fewer than 12 fantasy points in eight of his 16 games. The other thing to consider here is just the backfield, right? Last year, he shared it with no one other than Jordan Howard. They literally accounted for 94% of the running back touches there in Chicago, which is maybe not the highest rate, but it's got to be like top five rate in terms of just funneling touches to a specific group of running backs. Let's keep in mind that Jordan Howard is basically incapable of catching passes. Who else is going to catch passes at the running back position? This year, they went out, they signed Mike Davis, whose 34 receptions last year were more than Jordan Howard had in any of his three seasons with the Chicago Bears prior to that. And then they used third round draft capital on David Montgomery, who is a great receiving back, right? And we're already hearing a lot of rave reviews out of camp, out of uh, Chicago OTAs mini camp about how impressive he is in the receiving game, which should come as no surprise to you because we kind of already knew that. I also want to say this right now, I'm filming this on July 3rd. And it's not releasing till July 8th. So over the next five days, one, I'm going to be drinking a hell of a lot of margaritas. Two, there might be some news that breaks, you know, or not breaks, but there's going to be more beat reports and and things that kind of come out over the next few days that might change things or like an injury or something like that. So keep in mind, this is five days prior being filmed than when it's actually going to come out. Back to tree cone. I like to make my excuses so when I'm wrong, I don't look like as much of an asshole. You know, I, I talk about these running backs. I'm like, oh, they're going to come in and, and he's going to have to share more of the workload in the backfield. But, you know, admittedly, Tariq Cohen plays a high percentage of his snaps either in the slot or outside, which I think it was like a 30% rate or something like that. Targets and the reception strictly from the backfield, which are still a good portion of the, the numbers that he puts up, are definitely going to be going down because he wasn't competing with someone else that can catch balls last year in the backfield. Now he has two guys who were Jordan Howard-esque but with receiving ability in Mike Davis and David Montgomery. So Matt Nagy wants to use guys that can be used on all three downs. And both of those guys have three down skill sets. So he won't be afraid to leave those guys in over at Tariq Cohen if the choice comes up in 2019. Whereas in last year, it's like defenses aren't expecting Jordan Howard to catch passes, which makes them very one dimensional. And then, you know, you look at the rest of the weapons, why Tariq Cohen may have been so involved in the passing game. These might be reachy, but I still think they're notable and you should still consider them. I mean, Al Robinson missed three games, was banged up. You have Anthony Miller missed a couple games, and he basically was playing with one shoulder for the entire season after he separated one of his shoulders in like week two or three. Adam Sheehan missed almost all of the regular season. So not only was he not competing with anyone in the backfield, but they had a lot of their weapons banged up for the majority of the season. So where I feel like you have to pick Cohen, there's very little room for ROI from where I imagine his volume to be. And I want to I want to look at that volume, right? Because the, the problem with these backs that are inconsistent is having to choose when to sit or start them. And that's, you know, you have to factor the opportunity cost also. So if you're going to like 
be drafting guys, right? And your rankings, you move someone down the ranking sheet because, oh, we think they're going to miss like 14, or we miss, they're going to miss like two or three games. And you factor that into your ranking, so you move them down a little bit. I think guys like this, guys like James White, guys like pass catching backs who are very inconsistent, you also have to factor that in because, listen, you're going to play these guys a lot when they have 1 point, 2 point, 3 point games. So it's almost like you're not factoring them into missed games, but you have to factor them in to give you a lot of dud games. And just looking at last year, there were like a lot of separate times throughout the season for Tariq Cohen where he just gave stretches of dud games. I mean, you, you look at the first three weeks, he averaged seven touches a game and less than 45 total yards per game with, without scoring any touchdowns. Then, you know, he played really well. People get excited about him. Weeks 9 through 12, he averages just 10 touches a game below 42 total yards a game. Then weeks 15 to week 17, 7 touches a game, 32 and a half yards per game to end the season. I'm not nitpicking small sample sizes here. I'm not like trying to pace these out to full 16 game numbers and trying to delude what he did last year. But this is what happens when you pick guys like Tariq Cohen. You're going to get patches of games where the volume is very low and the yardage totals are very low. So you're banking on a touchdown from a guy that is not going to be getting like goal line carries. And as you can see, it happened like three times last year. And you have to think to yourself, like you're probably sitting him now for one or two of those three to four game stretches. And then are you like, if he has a bad three or four game stretch, you're obviously not going to be starting him in that fifth game. Like out of nowhere, you're not gonna be like, I feel like this is the one he bounces back in after four bad games. So in the game that he does bounce back and, and bust off his big game of 20 points or whatever, you probably didn't have him in your lineup. These these guys just become a minefield of just madness of trying to sit start them. And I'm gonna leave you with this chart. You might have seen this on Twitter or Instagram or YouTube or whatever. So make sure you're following me on all the social medias. I put together two running backs that are very similar in a lot of categories. But if you look at the last two rows, ADP overall, 57th, running back 28. ADP overall, 110, running back 44. When you actually look at the raw numbers, put them into context, there is not much difference between these two, right? Running back one is obviously Tariq Cohen. Running back two, who is running back two? Team scores more points. He gets more rushing work per game. He's more efficient on the ground. He does lose a little bit in terms of the receiving. Cohen averages a little less than two targets a game more, but they both score at almost the same rate. Running back two gets way more rushing work. The 10 zone carry market share is at 26%. His goal line carry market share on his team when he's playing is 40%. So whereas a guy like Cohen on those bad games, you're banking on a touchdown, Same thing with this guy who's more of a pass catching back and a secondary back, but at least he gets a decent portion of the work and the running work when they're close to the end zone. So that gives you at least high probability of, you know, that guy saving the game. Breakaway run rate, both of these guys are super efficient. You can see yards per touch, both rank within the top four in the NFL. Breakaway run rate in terms of percentage of plays that go, percentage of runs that go for 15 plus yards, number one and number two in the NFL. Games of double digit fantasy points. This is where, you know, the Cohen factor comes into play where it's like, yes, he's very boom bust. 62.5% of his games last year were double digit fantasy points. The other guy, 50%. At the same time, you think the ADP drop would come at the expense of like those boom games. Both of them had two games of 20 plus points. RB2 only played 14 games. So his rate of going 20 plus fantasy points is actually higher than Tariq Cohen's. So RB1 is Tariq Cohen. RB2 is Austin Eckler. You can get him 60 picks later, very likely to see the same volume. They saw nearly the same touches per game. I don't think the two players are going to be that much difference in terms of their stats at the end of the season. It's time to do some uh, draft guide giveaways. So what I did basically was look at all of the podcast reviews. I didn't look at them. I counted how many there were. I put that number into a random generator, one through 224, however many there are there. If you don't care for this draft guide giveaway thing, the timestamp will be down below to get to the next group of running backs. And then I just put that 224, one to 224, and whatever number it landed on, I would just scroll down and say it was like 74. I'd be like, okay, 74th review. You are the big winner. Draft guide is a $49.99 value. If you've already had the draft guide, I haven't checked if any of you guys already have the draft guide. I will be literally taking $50 out of my pocket and giving it back to you, which is really fucking dumb. I should have checked and just given it to people that don't have the draft guide yet, but hopefully it's probably that none of you guys caught this yet. First draft guide winner, rolling with it. I want nothing more to see Nick Prosper. Haven't subscribed to BDG channel for about a year now, and the only regret I have is that I never found it sooner. While listening to Nick's advice, it reminds me of when my buddies and I are just chilling, talking about fantasy. Nick is a genuine guy, and his fantasy advice is second to none. You'd be doing yourself a disservice by not listening to the podcast. Big facts only. Ho, ho. All right, Roland, uh, shoot me over an email. My email is nick at bigdogsfantasy.com. Shoot me over an email. Drop a comment down below. Uh, get in touch with me one way or another, and we will get you over access to the draft guide. 
Next winner is Mike Murph 21 best in the business. Been watching, listening for a year. Nick is by far the best, most in-depth analysis I've found. Love the year-round content, the five-day schedule during the summer, and all the big facts. Definitely know him better. You know what's fantastic? All of these happen to be five-star reviews, but if I did a random one and it landed on a one-star review and be like, this guy is a fucking cunt, I would have put this on the, uh, on the thing. So this really worked out well for me here. Third winner. Big Dog Daily Dosage by the Gronkinator. Great analysis and plenty entertaining. BDGE is a must listen if you're serious about winning your league. What's more, every, every weekday from June 1st throughout the summer, Nick is broadcasting who to draft, who not to draft, positional assessments and rankings, top sleepers, bus candidates. It's all here and presented with style. Mostly redraft and best ball league advice. Thank you, Gronkinator. So y'all three are the draft guide winners. Again, make sure you get in touch with me. If you haven't copied the draft guide yet, yeah, I don't know what you're doing. We've had a, a ton of, of feedback and very, very positive reviews. And there will be plenty of updates to the draft guide. It's updated throughout the entire summer. Rankings will be updated every Wednesday. It's on BigDogsDraftGuide.com. If you guys purchase it on BigDogsDraftGuide.com, that is also where you access it. I've had a lot of people purchase it there and then come over to BigDogsFantasy.com, which is where my blog is, and then ask me why they can't sign in. It's because it's two different websites, people. So BigDogsDraftGuide.com has got everything you need for your 2019 fantasy football season if you think these numbers are in depth whatsoever then the draft guide is going to blow you away let's move on to a couple other running backs that i don't want to go too in depth with first one is james white because he has basically the exact same analysis as these guys and i've talked about him last week i feel like in every it was just like shit on james white week basically at the hq james white pass catching back that we've seen play for four years now we had the sample size of who he was then everyone in that Patriots backfield got hurt, played really well, wasn't that good over the second half of the season. Once Sony Michelle and Rex Burkett came back, he was on and off, barely getting, you know, seven touches a game. And that's not what you want as a fifth round pick. And that's where James White's going right now. So James White falls into the Tariq Cohen category. I would say a little bit of a better offense, but a much, much, much less explosive player. So I would rather have Tariq Cohen than James White. James White was always a guy that you can get in the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th round. And that's why he seems like such a good value. But you don't draft the pass catching backs coming off of the big years. This is a big mistake that I think a lot of people are going to make this year. We saw it with Chris Thompson. We saw it with like Gio. We saw it. We see it every single year. Someone's going to have a really efficient season this season as the pass catching back on a ridiculously low volume, really high efficiency or really high touchdown totals that are not predictive for guys like this who don't see goal line carries normally, which is why the touchdowns aren't predictive and don't see enough volume in order to give us that floor. So these guys, not only do you have to discount because they don't see the volume, but just on the week over week basis on the fact that you're going to have to decide whether or not to sit start them because they have plenty of bus weeks. There's also opportunity costs banked into where they are. Ooh, that scared the shit out of me. Shut up. So we have James White. Stay away from James White. Oh my God. Stay away from my fucking doorbell too. Chris Carson is another guy. Uh, me and Snacks talked in depth with him on the last Fade the Public video when we kind of did our do not draft list. He picked Chris Carson as it and me, him, and Animal kind of went around the table talking about Chris Carson, whether we like him, whether we didn't like him. So I will link that down below as well as up top. If you want my thoughts on, on Chris Carson, go back to that video, get him. Last guy is Darius, guys. I'm glad his ADP has finally fallen pretty far down. He is a guy that is dealing with this ACL tear and it's scary because he had the three month table timetable in which he had to push back the surgery, right? So normally this is the nine to 12 month recovery and it happened in the summer. So now it's almost like the ACL happened because he had some infection and needed to move the surgery back and the timetable for recovery is pushed back by this you know, amount of time. Now you're looking at it as a nine to 12 month recovery from say three months push back so you know late october november december whenever and those are the guys that i'm not looking to grab this year you know as we talked about with dr morse whose injury write-ups are in the big dog draft guide and they will be coming out more and more as the weeks go by those are guys you want to stay away, uh, away from guys who tore their acl like mid-year last year you want to wait until the second year they're back so same thing with like dalvin cook right last year was probably not the year to get him we saw he came back obviously a little bit too early had the hamstring injuries and by the end of the season, he was finally, you know, fully recovered, ready to go. We like Dalvin Cook this year. Darius Geis, we're probably a year off of Darius Geis. You also look at like an Adrian Peterson, you know, like he was bitching and whining on the Saints, right? He wanted out of there ASAP as soon as he wasn't getting the carries he thought he deserved. I mean, dude, if there was an offense that you could exceed on lower carries, it would have been the Saints, as we've seen with almost every running back they've had over the last five years. Adrian Peterson got out of there. He resigned a two-year deal this offseason. If he didn't think he was going to play or if he thought he was going to sit behind Darius Geis this whole year, I don't think he would have resigned. They also 
They have Bryce Love, who I think will probably, it, this will be like a redshirt rookie season for him. But they have Adrian Peterson. They have Chris Thompson coming back from the injury. So it's like a crowded backfield. And I feel like they are kind of telling us that Darius Geis will probably not be like fully ready, at least for like the first month, two months of the season. So his injury scares the shit out of me. It's probably not a guy I'm drafting within the first like eight rounds, uh, unfortunately, because if he was fully healed, if this was next year and it was the same situation, I'd probably be all in on Geis as like a fifth round pick. But that's not really where I'm at. So as you can see, the overarching theme of a lot of these mid-round running backs is that I don't really like them. A lot of this year, I think the strategy is going to be getting these running backs early, man. I like the early running backs because you have a lot of the running backs going early that are like workhorses. We have a lot of workhorse NFL running backs right now. And they're all going very, very early in drafts. So I'm hoping to come away with like two running backs out of the top three rounds. And then that, you know, and, and getting one of the top tier wide receivers there. So you get two nice running backs and then the mid rounds are just sprinkled with value at wide receiver. I mean, the third round is is all like T.Y. Hilton and Adam Thielen, Stephon Diggs. And then the fourth round is, you know, Brandon Cooks, Robert Woods, Kenny Galladay. Fifth round is Chris Godwin and Calvin Ridley, DJ Moore, Sammy Watkins. So you can get your wide receiver one and then still stack up your wide receiver two and flex spots with all this value in the middle rounds. Sixth round, seventh round, I'm probably looking at one of the, the mid-round tight ends, whether it's OJ Howard, Hunter Henry, and then maybe grabbing my third running back, like a high upside guy like Rashad Penny. But I'm not looking to use a fourth round pick on, on, on these running backs that are super risky and super volatile and super inconsistent. So the overall draft strategy is almost stay away from these guys. But in the Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Draft Guide, uh, I do a monster write-up every year. It's like somewhere between five and 10,000 words. I call it the Big Dogs Bible, where I literally, basically that whole spiel I just put out, break down into like 10,000 words. Uh, my exact strategy each year about how I would attack, attack my fantasy drafts, position by position, where I think the weak spots are, where you want to start drafting players and certain whatever. So that's another really good article exclusive article in there that will not be on youtube that will drop on august 1st it doesn't drop it didn't drop when it originally went live last week because a lot of shit happens between now and then if i write up an entire strategy and then it becomes irrelevant a lot of work that i should not have done so that's going to wrap it up for today's video uh, again if you enjoyed the video all i ask that you hit that thumbs up button drop a comment down below let me know what you think about these mid-round running backs are you looking to draft them are you looking to stay away away from them do you have the same strategy i do let a brother know and i will see you Tomorrow with my man Noah, FB God, for bold predictions. We out of here. Peace.